Good evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Tamburi, and I'm Dean of the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute. And we're delighted to be able to sponsor uh, this event this evening. And I should say that uh, this is really sort of part one uh, of another event that we're going to have a couple of months down the road. Uh, part of the issue is traveling and the whole uh, challenges that have uh, been presented because of COVID, but we still wanted to make sure that we gave you an idea of um, who uh, Uguccione di Sorbello was uh, this evening. And then, as I said, later down the road, what we'll have is something more substantial, more in the sense of a symposium, a full bread symposium on uh, the subject matter. We're gonna hear from a number of people. Uh, the first person we're gonna hear from, videotape, uh, it is uh, late in Italy and um, there are many other things that, that the Rettore of the Università Pessoniere di Perugia has on his plate. And um, so he's, uh, has, he's gonna greet us uh, via videotape and we're gonna hear that right now. Cari amici del Calandra Institute, mi fa molto piacere rivolgere questo saluto in occasione dell'inaugurazione della mostra dedicata a Uccione Ranieri. Eh, si tratta di un evento che coinvolge l'Università del Stranieri di Perugia, non solo perché Uccione è una personalità rilevante per Perugia, la sua storia è intimamente connessa alla città di Perugia in cui l'Università, la nostra Università, vive ma anche perché il titolo stesso di questa vostra mostra, Un intellettuale tra due mondi, richiama a una caratteristica di un cuccione che è anche molto cara all'Università Pestanieri, che è quella di essere ponte tra mondi diversi, eh, collegamento, dialogo, confronto, cioè di essere capaci di mettere assieme persone provenienti da ambienti diversi e di creare legami. Questo è vero nella storia di Cuccione ed è vero nella storia ormai centenaria della nostra istituzione perugina. Eh, saluto il Dean Anthony Tamburri, saluto e mi complimento con la curatrice della mostra, Antonella Valoroso, saluto tutti voi e rivolgo un saluto anche al nostro professore Roberto Dolci che è lì con voi e che in qualche modo rappresenta questo legame che, che noi abbiamo da tanti anni tra il Calandra Institute e l'Università Pestranieri di Perugia. È frutto di questa collaborazione anche una borsa di studio, una fellowship dedicata proprio a Romain, a Robert e a Buccione Ranieri di Sorbello e questo è un piccolo eh, gesto concreto che queste nostre istituzioni hanno voluto fare assieme per eh, consolidare questi legami che ci, che ci vedono ormai da tanti anni collaborare. Io sono dispiaciuto di non poter essere lì a New York con voi, di non poter visitare la mostra in questi giorni, ma eh, la, la mia visita da voi è soltanto rimandata, spero che si potrà compiere presto e vi ringrazio ancora di questa bella mossa su Cuccione e vi auguro buon, buoni lavori in questo convegno e a presto. Un caro saluto. So we want to thank um, the President Valerio De Cesaris for taking time out of his busy schedule to say hello. And as you realize, this is going to be a bilingual uh, event tonight. Um, some of us are speaking in English. Some of us will speak in Italian. If, you, uh, if you're Italian, it's, if you're challenged a little bit by Italian, don't worry, you'll be able to, this will be up online in the next 24, 48 hours, and you'll be able to actually go back and listen to it again. Um, I want to, before I introduce to you Ruggiero Ranieri, I want to just make a few comments about, as uh, those of you who do understand Italian, as you heard um, 
President De Cesare say, uh, the, the title is Ugucione da Sorbello, Intellettuale tra due mondi, an intellectual between two worlds. And that bridge, he, he really represented at a time uh, a bridge, a very important bridge um, between uh, cultural Italy and let's say cultural USA. And of course, very much so also for the Italian American community here in the United States. Um, the, he, he worked at a time and you'll hear our speakers get, um, go into this further, but he worked um, at a time where he worked, he, he was engaged as a, a cultural broker, as an intellectual uh, scholar, uh, at a time when the, the structures we have today didn't exist. And I'm thinking specifically of the Italian Cultural Institutes, the first one in, uh, which was founded in New York, was set up in actually 1961. Ugucione was working since the 30s as far as spreading the word, quote unquote, with regard to Italian culture. So, so we owe a lot to him. He represents the fact that we're sort of, some of us are discovering him only in the last couple of years uh, means that we need to do more. And it means that there's a whole world of cultural Italy, uh, cultural Italy slash USA of those years uh, up, in, up through the 60s of which we know very little. And so I'm just delighted that we're beginning here. I'm also delighted and very grateful for the generosity that is coming forth for the fellowship that uh, President De Cesare's mentioned that it's coming forth from the Fondazione um, uh, Sorbello, Guccione Sorbello, um, in which Dr. Ranieri is uh, the moving force. So um, with that, let me introduce you, in fact, to Ruggiero mm -hmm. Ranieri, who is indeed the president of the Fondazione, uh, uh, Fondazione uh, Ranieri di Sorbello in Perugia and its sister Fondazione in New York. Um, He's in himself an active intellectual, engaged more in the world of museum culture and museum. And um, he has also written and edited a couple of volumes. And he is going to uh, now give us more information uh, about uh, his father, Ugucioni di Sorbello. Uh, Ruggiero, the microphone is yours. Uh, he's muted. You're muted, Ruggiero. Thank you, Anthony, for your introduction, and thank you for hosting this exhibition, uh, which uh, for our, our foundations is 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 of great of great importance. Uh, of course, the exhibition is on the life and work of Ugucione Ranieri di Sorbello my father who died in 1969, uh, he, 52 years ago. Uh, and it focuses on his relationships, his, his work in the United States. I, I'll say a bit more about this. Ugucione, uh, he, his mother was an American and he spent an important part of his life in the United States. In fact, he was always on, on the move between Italy and America. He started his career uh, as a teacher, a journalist, and an essayist in the 1930s as an instructor of Italian language and literature at the University of Yale. He wrote in various newspapers, lectured in various institutions, and was, and was also editor of a cultural journal published by the Italy America Society in New York. Among his teachers and mentors at this time, i.e. during the 1930s, were intellectuals such as Giuseppe Prezzolini, then head of the Casa Italiana, and Giuseppe Antonio Borgese, whose literary work Ugucione greatly admired, and who also guided him in, one, in, in the late 1940s to join the World Federalist Movement which was perhaps the greatest political passion of Ugucione's life, uh, apart from his juvenile nationalism. In fact, Ugucione moved back to Italy in the late 30s and uh, 
he served uh, during the war as an Italian officer. And after 1943, he joined the Allied troops and carried out dangerous missions in German occupied territory for which he was rewarded with the silver medal and other awards. In fact, the section of the exhibition recalls his actions as a war hero. And Guccione then spent another five very important years in New York, in the US actually, in the US, between 1953 and 1958, as cultural attaché to the Italian embassy in New York, in Washington, I'm sorry, in Washington. Most of the time, however, he spent in New York laying the foundations of what was later to become the Italian Cultural Institute. All, this, all his work in these crucial years is well documented in the exhibition. In 1953, from his office, he started publishing a bulletin of Italian news, which is called the Italian Scene, uh, which was intended to reach all those interested in the latest events in Italy. Uh, he could, this was very much a one-man show. He wrote it uh, by himself. Um, from the first page to the last. And he continued, to write, he continued to write this until his death in 1969, churning out thousands of pages of enlightened journalism, which are still a pleasure to read and which we think uh, are still a valid source for anybody interested in exploring um, the, the life and the culture of Italy in those years. Having returned to Italy in 1958, um, he continued to build bridges between the two countries he loved, Italy and the United States. As a functionary of the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs, he traveled extensively on lecture tours in the US, be it for the celebrations of the centenary of Italian unification, the commemoration of Dante Alighieri and other occasions. Uguccione is also well known in Italy for his literary work. He published short stories and novels, one of which became a bestseller in the 1960s. He lived uh, most of his time in the town of Perugia, where the Fondazione Ranieri di Sorbello is now based. In fact, his work and his interests have inspired our work as we try to carry on his legacy. The Sorbello Foundation, created in the US in 2012, is a charitable educational uh, 501c3 with a mission of building cultural bridges between the United States and Italy through research in the arts and humanities. One of our latest projects is to support the Romain Robert and Uguccione Sorbello Fellowship Grant to be awarded to a person working on relationships uh, between Italy and the United States in any of their various dimensions. The grant is co-sponsored with the John Calandra Italian American Institute and in partnership with the Università Pestranieri di Perugia. Let me end this short introduction by extending my warmest thanks to all those who have made this event possible, starting with my two fellow board members of the Sorbello Foundation, Professor Antonella Valoroso, curator of the exhibition, who has been working tirelessly over the last few months, preparing the material and putting together the story of Uguccione's life. And uh, second, and Professor Dolci, a scholar of linguistics, who came across Uguccione when preparing his latest book on Giuseppe Prezzolini. Professor Dolci, has been our invaluable anchor in New York over the last few months, since he, like Uguccione, travels tirelessly across the Atlantic and, more, and, more, and, and even more travels between Perugia and New York. A great thank you also to the Università Pestranieri and to Professor Valerio De Cesaris, who accepted to add the prestigious name of his institution to our project. Finally, and most warmly, again, thanks to the John Calandra Institute and their staff for their hospitality and support that has allowed us to achieve one of our most cherished goals, 
to bring back the story of Uguccione to New York. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruggiero. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Roberto Dolci, as you heard, who is a professor of linguistics at the University for Foreigners in Perugia, and indeed the author of a volume, recent volume, on Giuseppe Prezzolini's um, Il Giornalino. Uh, Roberto is also the delegate for international relations of the, of the University for Foreigners in Perugia. Roberto, the microphone's all yours. Thank you, thank you, Anthony. As you said before, uh, this is gonna be a bilingual <laughs> event. So I switched to Italian. I try to speak slowly in Italian. So if you want to try to understand me in Italian, you can do some practice. <laughs> okay. Um, Guccione, come, come avete sentito, è uno dei tanti intellettuali che uh, durante gli anni 30 uh, passano l'Atlantico e, e vengono qua negli Stati Uniti. Nella costa, nella costa ovest in particolare, nella costa est in particolare. E vengono qua per vari motivi, alcuni fuggono dal fascismo, come, come Salvemini, come, come Borgese, come Cantarella, altri invece vengono per promuovere il fascismo, come, come Giuseppe Prezzolini, per esempio, quando diventa direttore della Casa Italiana di Columbia University, altri vengono invece più per ragioni personali, come Uguccione Regni di Sorbello. La cosa interessante è che poi tutti questi intellettuali italiani, definiamoli così, si incontrano con gli intellettuali americani di origine italiana, tra cui possiamo citare per esempio Angelo Patri, possiamo citare Leonardo Covello, persone che sono diventate punto di riferimento della comunità italiana. E questo crea un ambiente particolarmente, particolarmente importante, particolarmente fertile di discussione sulla sull'Italia, sul, sul ruolo dell'Italia in quel momento. Chiaramente le posizioni sono, sono molto diverse, e, ma un aspetto interessante di quel periodo è che tutte comunque convergono su un aspetto, la promozione della lingua e della cultura italiana e l'importanza della cultura italiana come punto di riferimento per tutta la cultura, la cultura occidentale. E non a caso questo sforzo notevole poi dà un, dà un successo incredibile perché nel giro di pochi, di dieci anni praticamente, dal 1930 fino al 1940, l'italiano cresce esponenzialmente negli Stati Uniti, l'italiano viene proposto finalmente nelle scuole uh, medie e superiori, l'italiano ha un grosso boom all'università, tantissimi studenti uh, vanno, vanno in Italia e tantissimi studenti insomma, imparano, imparano, imparano l'italiano. E quindi, nonostante ci fossero posizioni diverse, cioè se da un lato, per esempio, eh, Giuseppe Prezzolini e la Casa Italiana promuovevano l'insegnamento della lingua per, eh, per promuovere, chiaramente, il fascismo, da questo punto di vista appoggiati dal governo, eh, dall'altro c'erano eh, la comunità, gli intellettuali della comunità italiana volevano che i, i, i discendenti americani di origine italiana Uh, imparassero meglio l'italiano proprio per rafforzare i legami con la comunità e fare sentire queste persone come appartenenti attraverso uh, la, il possesso della lingua italiana in maniera identitaria di una comunità. Tutto questo però porta chiaramente ad, una, ad un processo di uh, avanzamento del, degli studi, del, dell'offerta dell'italiano in quel periodo. L'evoluzione si muove proprio tra tra queste, tra queste istanze, il nome, de, il nome proprio della cultura italiana che lui, che, di cui lui è un fervido sostenitore. E lui da un lato uh, collabora con Giuseppe Prezzolini uh, alla Casa Italiana, al giornalino, e al tempo stesso, uh, per esempio insegnando a Yale, ma soprattutto a Midbury, uh, lavora a stretto contatto con alcuni esponenti di quella che era la Mazzini Society, cioè di quel gruppo di intellettuali antifascisti che appunto cercavano di portare avanti, di proporre anche valori, i valori, gli altri valori, i valori democratici dell'Italia, tra cui per esempio c'era Michele, Michele Cantarella. Poi lui, Uguccione, scrive su vari, appunto, come sentivamo prima, scrive su vari giornali, scrive su varie riviste, promuovendo uh, l'insegnamento italiano e anche suscitando in alcuni articoli che poi un paio sono riprodotti anche qui nella mostra, proprio l'orgoglio di essere riusciti a, a proporre e a imporre in un certo senso a promuovere l'italiano, l'insegnamento dell'italiano nelle scuole. C'è un altro aspetto che mi pare che vorrei sottolineare, perché poi è un po' specifico del, del lavoro che faccio, del, de, della mia ricerca, che è 
il, il metodo, l'approccio che, uh, che Uguccione usa nell'insegnare la lingua italiana e si vede molto chiaramente da quello, da quello che scrive, da quello che fa e soprattutto uh, si vede in un, uh, in un articolo che lui scrive per, per Atlantica, che è una delle riviste più importanti di quel periodo per la comunità uh, americana di origine italiana, in cui lui uh, dice una cosa molto che adesso può sembrare, può sembrare molto, molto banale, ma a quei tempi non lo era, per imparare una lingua bisogna, bisogna parlarla. E quindi, uh, come dire, proprio uh, staccandosi in maniera netta da quello che era il metodo tradizionale, traduttivo uh, o di lettura, invece proponendo una, un approccio sicuramente più, più autentico, più reale, uh, quello di vivere in un certo senso la lingua. E non a caso fa un esempio molto interessante per le frasi idiomatiche, dicendo se le traducete letteralmente hanno tutto un significato, quindi che invece non è quello reale della vita della vita autentica. Sicuramente in questo lui viene aiutato o almeno trae ispirazione sia dalla, dalla scuola italiana del Midbury, in cui viene proprio adottato questo approccio uh, di immersione totale nella lingua italiana, sia da, da quello che poi è stato l'approccio che ha utilizzato anche Giuseppe Prezzolini, che nei suoi studi proprio uh, parla di, di uscire dall'atteggiamento tradizionale uh, di, le, di lezione tradizionale, ma proprio di far lavorare in maniera pratica e pragmatica legato poi anche al pragmatismo, i suoi, i suoi studenti. Non a caso Guccione, poi avendo anche una mano particolarmente felice nello scrivere, uh, scrive anche un, un testo teatrale in questo senso per i suoi studenti, uh, perché poi venga rappresentato appunto dai suoi studenti. Con le signore uh, c'è più gusto. Uh, un altro aspetto interessante dal punto di vista grotto didattico è la suo, il, su, il come lui uh, appunto scrive, tratta, tratta l'errore, dicendo bisogna far parlare lo studente, di non aver paura di, di fare errori, perché anzi, facendo errori, poi riusciremo noi, noi insegnanti a suggerirgli il modo, il modo, il modo migliore per, 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 per correggerlo. E questo è un altro, dei, un altro degli aspetti, un'altra un indicazione di come lui avesse questa fortissima capacità relazionale e affettiva e unita alla capacità poi di saper coinvolgere i suoi ascoltatori e come abbiamo sentito prima ha avuto sempre un enorme successo nelle sue lezioni che ha fatto, le sue conferenze culturali che ha fatto in giro per, per gli Stati Uniti e anche da, proprio dalla sua scrittura e si, e si rivede molto chiaramente questo suo stile per esempio nella, nel, nel bollettino dell'Italian Scene. Quindi la mostra eh, curata da Antonella Valoroso riporta un po' tutto questo percorso di una vita che è sicuramente molto molto intensa e molto, molto piena. E poi il fatto che sia organizzata congiuntamente dalla fondazione, eh, dalla, dalla Sorbello Foundation, la, la sorella della, eh, americana della, della, della fondazione Sorbello, e dal Calandra Institute e dalla Stranieri di Perugia, è un po' come dire, vuole rappresentare il passaggio di testimoni di quell'impegno che ha testimoniato eh, Uguccione nella promozione della lingua e della cultura italiana. E la, la, la possibilità di questa fellowship, uh, data proprio dalla nominata Romanian Robert e uh, Fellowship, sarà sicuramente utile per continuare a scavare in questo enorme uh, ancora uh, patrimonio che è l'ascito che, che ha lasciato uh, Uguccione, ma poi tutto quello che poi gli sta intorno. Grazie. Our next speaker is Professor Fred Gardefay, who is Distinguished Professor of English and Italian American Studies at Queens College and is also part of the Calandra Institute. Um, Fred is um, definitely in the top two or three of distinguished voices with regard to literary criticism and cultural studies um, for Italian American studies, uh, as well as his work on quote unquote American writers. Um, this evening, he's entering this new field that we're all entering and gladly to enter of, uh, we can call it, let's say, Sorbello Studies. Fred? Muted. <laughs> How many times have I told people, unmute yourself, unmute yourself. Um, thank you very much for. Uh, bringing uh, Uguccione Ranieri Sobello to my attention. Um, I'm not really new to his work, uh, except th that he's done it. 
Uh, it's work that I and people like Anthony have been doing all our lives, uh, becoming this intellectual between two worlds. Uh, uh, it was very difficult entering as an Italian American into the American intellectual world. And when we went to Italy, uh, it, it took me a while uh, and I had to improve my Italian uh, to bring it up from the dialect that I thought was Italian when I first went to Italy, which turned out not to be Italian, but really Castellanese. Um, and the, um, you know, the struggles of, of trying to have your thoughts encountered by others and received and, and, and have and create a dialogue in both in both countries. Uh, we still struggle today with Italian American studies in the United States. Um, Italy has gotten much better. And so when I read through the materials uh, that Antonella and um, uh, Ruggiero uh, had sent me, I said, this guy needs to be recognized. Uh, but I was most struck uh, certainly by his work, uh, by his tireless energy, by his devotion to what? Uh, his devotion to not just to Italian culture, but for people to understand Italian culture. This is the key. Understanding Italian culture, because I would argue that most Italian American organizations do not understand Italian culture. Uh, I, would, I would also argue that most Italian Americans do not understand both Italian culture and Italian American culture. And I'm not saying you have to spend a whole life studying these cultures like many of us have in order to, to come to some great awareness. Uh, uh, but, but we do need to kind of pay attention to the kind of work that Sorbello does because what he did more than anything else was he distilled what was going on in the world and he gave it to the people who didn't have time to sit in libraries, who didn't have time to you know, go off on research trips or, or produce papers for conferences. He brought it to the people and even much more so than a journalist because I, I, he may have had some kind of editorial oversight that he had to deal with, but most of the work he did was saying, this is what's happening here and this is what's happening here. And these, these are some of the great fit, you know. And so he, he was a great synthesizer and the synthesizers, as far as I'm concerned, are always the ones who are overlooked. You know, the ones who make it easy for other people are always used and stepped on and moved ahead. And to me, that seems to be what happened with Sorbella. He devoted so much of his life to organizations, to help in the United States in World War II, to, to doing things for others that he rarely had time to spend for himself. So when Antonella said, oh, we have a bit of his autobiography that he started. Um, I said, I need to see that because I have spent a lot of time studying uh, immigrant autobiography and I've written very much on it. Um, and uh, I, uh, so I, I, I looked into this and what we have are 89 short segments in very beautiful script. Uh, I was thinking the other day as I was talking to my grandson, I wrote him a, something on a card for his birthday and he didn't, he couldn't read it because they don't teach script anymore. And I immediately while I'm reading Sorbella, I'm thinking, is this going to happen to him? Will people not be able to read him a hundred years from now because people can't read script and they find his work in the archives? I don't know what's going to happen there, but when we, I, I saw these little 89 pieces, and I, I would call it pieces of an autobiography. It has a title. It's called Start Remembering. And uh, really, all it is, is is the start of remembering. But it's precious. It's so precious, especially if you're going to go on and study any of the work that Sorbella did as an adult, because he lays the foundation. He doesn't know he does it, maybe, or maybe he did know. Um, he lays the foundation for why he did all this work. I, my only wish is that he would have had time and would have had the energy to go on and finish it. He starts writing it when he's 56 years old and he writes it so that his son can understand him. Uh, when I uh, was in my uh, 40s, I, I, you know, I keep, I've been keeping a journal on my bookshelf behind me at the bottom. There's many, many journals from when I was 17 years old till now. 
my daughter turned 18. I gave her my, my journal for when I was 18. And uh, I don't think she really ever read it. <laughs> I would have died to have a journal from my father when he was 18. And so in this little start of remembering, we get a sense of his early family life, his life in Perugia, uh, life in Rome. And you think, well, so what? We have, you know, everybody has a life, everybody. But how many people have told us what it's like to drive a, a, a car, one of the early automobiles from Perugia, from Rome to Perugia? Uh, the, the automotive travel that he talks about and the way and the dog that would sit on the running board and uh, how they had to carry their own gas in the car because there, there were no gas stations. I mean, these are things that absolutely are, are, are mind boggling. And you begin to see, yes, he did live a privileged life. We're not, we're not, I'm not going to say that he came up from the ghetto and he lived like this, but it's what he did with that privileged life. To me, in many respects, he's like uh, a secular saint of Italian American culture. Uh, he has gone on, uh, you know, like, like some of those early saints who were born to rich families who took off all their clothes and put on rags and went out and started working with the people in the streets. He could have gone anywhere. And we see that in his autobiography. He, he was a great tennis player. He won awards. He was always uh, being uh, uh, faded by his grandmother at different dinners, going around. And, and his grandmother was part of the, of the elite uh, of, uh, of East Coast culture. Um, and she did a lot of uh, uh, entertaining and so on and brought him with him. And we'll, we'll talk about language in a second, but he talks about wearing hats. You know, very, I mean, when I was a kid, I could remember all I wanted to do was to be able to wear one of those cool hats that my father and all those uncles wore in the 1950s. And by the time I got to the 1960s, nobody wore hats anymore. Uh, and so on. So, but he talks about, you know, the, the custom of wearing hats and, and what happened, the, dif the difference in Italy, between, in the United States, between when men are wearing hats and women arrive and so on. Uh, the difference in, in the United States where men would take off their hats in an elevator, but would put them on, you know, as, as soon as, a, and they would walk all out of the elevator so a woman could get in. But when the women came in, they, they would, you know, hold their hands and, and, and put them on in the presence of women outside of the elevator. Um, it's just, just amazing little, little things. And, and you begin to connect these little insights. And he does, it, it's, it's very little. I think if you typed it all up, it couldn't be any more than 20 pages. Uh, but it gives you great insight into transatlantic travel, what it was like to be on those, those ships that took anywhere from 10 to 14 days to come to the United States. Uh, he talks about um, his early theater experience. Um, and, and, and through it all, we get this sense of the, the cultural difference of behavior of people in Italy and people in the United States. There's an interesting thing when he's traveling, he goes to a hospital because he got, he's got some bad eyes. He goes to a hospital in Washington, DC, and he sees this sign all over Washington, D.C. And the sign says, park your camel with Uncle Samuel. And I thought, what is this? Is this something crazy? So I looked it up. And it turns out the United States in the mid 1800s was thinking about producing an army corps with camels to work in the Southwest in the United States. And they actually imported camels and they tried these troops and the sign that he looked at, he doesn't give a context for the sign, but the sign that he looked at could very well have been an announcement of the, you know, they were attempting to build the United States Army Museum in 1923. Um, and he attests, he, he attests this, uh, this sign to the propensity in America to kind of live by slogans. So he, 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 he's got some great little insights and he doesn't, he probably doesn't even know what he's passing along to us, but it's, it's, it's a treasure in this little, little uh, bits of autobiography. Um, he, uh, he, he talks about some of his early uh, love stories, uh, his first job 
which was as an elevator boy in the uh, McAlpin building in Times Square. I'm, I'm sure the McAlpin uh, Hotel is, I'm sorry, the McAlpin Hotel. I'm sure that hotel is not there anymore. But the stories of, um, of what he has produced in his autobiography ring quite truly with many of the themes that you find in Italian American immigrant autobiography. It's not so much the story of an individual, but the story of the group that makes the individual. And that's what we understand uh, when we begin to explore some of these other writings of him. Um, I mean, they're, they're, you know, I, I don't have the time right now to, to, to talk about all his journalism and so on and what he tried to do with Italian American organizations. That devotes a lot more study and a lot more attention to his uh, journalistic writings. Um, but I wanna thank uh, Antonello and Ruggiero for bringing this very rich material and um, maybe we could even see this get published someday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, you've already heard, uh, partly introduced Antonella Valoroso by Ruggiero. Um, she is, uh, her day job is teaching courses on history and culture for the Umbra Institute. She has been with the Sorbello um, Foundation for uh, more than a decade and has also curated numerous uh, shows before exhibits before this one. Um, I just want to point out one or two because they are as well as this one of sort of an international character. For example, um, one on Shakespeare in Italia, another one Rossini la cultura musicale, a Palazzo Sorbello, another one Squadri del Novecento, and um, l'eredità umana intellettuale di Ugo Cione Ranieri di Sorbello, and other, uh, in other exhibits. Tonight, she's going to delve deeper into the exhibit. You see parts of it behind me and behind Professor um, uh, Dolci. Antonella? Uh, hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, being here tonight is uh, truly a, a great privilege. I, I thank you all for your kind words. Uh, I thank Professor Ranieri in particular for his words, uh, for his words and for having uh, given me the opportunity to, to, to discover and fall in love in a way with, uh, with Uguccione. Um, and I share uh, his words of gratitude for towards all the people uh, and institutions already mentioned. And I want, uh, I won't repeat myself, but uh, really a great thank you uh, to everybody. Um, Uguccione Ranieri di Sorbello was indeed an intellectual between two worlds. He was very active on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, yet the uh, exhibit itinerary illustrates in particular uh, what I tried to do, what I wanted to do was to illustrate his life and legacy, uh, focusing on his activity in the United States. Uh, uh, the materials, part of them, uh, part of which I will be showing you uh, in, in a minute, are um, reproductions from uh, pictures and documents, mostly from the Fondazione Ranieri di Sorbello archive uh, in Perugia. Uh, in my presentation, I will uh, show and comment on some of them. Uh, and uh, I invite you all to, uh, to visit the exhibition, uh, to explore all of them, to stop and and read there's much more than what I have time to illustrate tonight, but I'm going to give you uh, a, a, a little taste, a uh, little taste of it. Uh, and as it has been already said, uh, I really hope that this exhibition could be uh, the uh, starting point of a longer journey. And uh, I hope that uh, there will be the possibility, as uh, Professor Garlafe was, was just saying, to get to know more about uh, a figure, uh, that of Uguccione Ranieri di Sorbello, which certainly deserves to be rediscovered. For now, we have brought him back to New York, thanks to uh, the Calandra Institute and the University for Foreigners, thanks to Professor Tamburi and Professor Dolci, and that's, uh, that's why this is a, uh, a really like a fantastic uh, evening for myself and for the Sorbello Foundation. 
uh, I'm now going to uh, to share my screen so that uh, I can show you some pictures. If only the uh, if only I get the privileges to do so because right now I'm I'm blocked and I can't do that. So I need the okay from the uh, Calandra Institute, which is handling this Zoom uh, uh, webinar. <clears throat> it's like Houston, we have a problem. Uh, so I hope that uh, already the organizer has echoed me. Please. Just a moment, then everything will be ready. Don't worry. Uh huh. No, I know we are in good hands. As usual, we tried it before and everything worked, and now it doesn't work. <laughs> it always happens with technology, sometimes it happens with technology. Already, here we go. Now, okay, I think now you. Okay, uh, this is just a poster of the exhibition which is hanging around. So I will just, uh, uh, I will move uh, on. And uh, here we can see uh, um, Charlotte Show. Uh, that has been already uh, mentioned by Professor Garda Fay. So here we see some uh, samples, some of the papers of the autobiography that was quoted before. Uh, I start remembering. Uh, we all know how important first impressions are. And uh, in this slide, we see, uh, we get to see something about Uguchone's first journey to the United States, which happened uh, almost a, a hundred years ago. Uh, it was 1922. So next year, it's going to be a uh, hundred years. Uh, on that occasion, he was accompanied by his grandmother, uh, Charlotte Shaw Robert, who was also a second cousin of George Bernard Shaw. Uh, they were heading to uh, Washington, D.C., but it was New York City, in New York City, that Uguchone received the most striking impressions. In uh, his autobiograph autobiographical notes uh, written in 1962, uh, and you see some of them reproduced here with this beautiful end writing, uh, he remembers how, and I quote, even at that time, the city, New York, gave me that feeling of infinity, which is still does. The love for New York uh, will last for an entire life. And as said before, now, uh, Uguchon is back uh, in New York. Um, the first uh, American uh, stay of uh, Uguchone was uh, evoked uh, by Professor Dolce before. So here in this slide, I have summed up some of the documents which are uh, on display in the exhibition. We see Uguchone uh, in a photo taken in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, in 1936, uh, probably before he was uh, living to go back uh, to Italy. He taught at Yale from 1930 to uh, 1936, and he became very quickly an active member of the academic community, taking part in, in the initiatives promoting the, by the Yale Italian Society and by New Haven's Circolo Italiano. Uh, from 1932, he was also regularly invited uh, to lecture at the Circolo Italiano in Boston. And here we see uh, his um, willingness to be with the people, to share, even with small communities like Circoli Italiani in New Haven or in Boston, uh, his knowledge uh, and the passion for Italian, uh, Italian culture. He was also engaged in initiatives promoted in New York by the Casa Italiana uh, at Columbia University and by the Italy America Society. 
Uh, in the middle of uh, the center of this slide, uh, we can see the uh, play bill of the uh, comedies, uh, Premier Etiel Experimental Theater, called uh, Signore C'è Più Gusto, uh, and that premiere uh, was on May 3rd, 1934. Uh, it's uh, interesting to remember that he wrote this play for didactic reason, to engage students in using the Italian language. And if we think that we're talking about 1934, uh, as was remarked already by Professor Dolce, this is quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, two years later, uh, the play was also printed in New York, and it's um, interesting to, uh, to note and to remember that he also suggested to the uh, publishing house to have the accents of the Italian act, uh, language printed on the page so that American readers, non-native speakers, would not have troubles anymore reading Italian and would not get that accent uh, wrong, hoping that in the future that would become the, uh, the new rule. Unfortunately, it did not. So even today, uh, non-native speakers of Italian struggle with accents when they have to learn the language. Uh, to the left, uh, we can also see uh, a picture uh, of the Italian school faculty during the summer of 1935 at Middlebury uh, College, uh, the school where uh, Ugucione taught uh, in the summer. During this first stay in the United States, which covers the year 1930 to 36, Ugucione was also very busy, uh, very engaged in journalism. Uh, so here we can see uh, some examples of, uh, of his work uh, as a journalist. He published articles in various periodicals and newspapers printed on the uh, west coast of the United States, Corriere del Connecticut, Yale Daily News, Corriere d'America, Il Giornalino della Casa Italiana, Il Progresso Italo-Americano, Italy America Monthly, and Italy America Review. Uh, in 1936, he also became the managing editor of the Italy America Review, uh, the quarterly journal published by the Italy America Society in cooperation with uh, the American Society of the Royal Italian Orders. Uh, and uh, here uh, we can uh, see also uh, what Professor Dolci was mentioning before, uh, how uh, the, 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 sad, the, the enthusiasm of uh, Ugucione at the idea that finally the schools in New Haven uh, have made the teaching of Italian language available to students. So he says, genitori di New Haven, fate tutti il vostro dovere. Now have your kids enrolled, otherwise, uh, the efforts to achieve this goal would have been uh, useless. He, uh, the relationship and the, 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 the willingness to, to be of help, to cooperate on uh, an international level is evident also in the uh, engagement with the Allied troops uh, of Ubuccione during uh, World War II. Uh, these are just some of the documents uh, presenting in the exhibition. Uh, here we can see the uh, his military uh, ID. Uh, and uh, even if uh, Ugucione did not like much to talk about uh, this part of his life, there's no doubt that he was uh, a World War II, uh, a World War II hero. He took part in uh, numerous rescue actions of escaped Allied prisoners. Uh, in the winter of 1943 and spring 1944, he organized in central Italy an escape route, uh, the so-called Rat Line, among which thousands of Allied prisoners managed to reach safety. For this uh, and for other successful missions, he was uh, later decorated with a bronze and a silver medal. And in September 1945, as we can see here on the slide, British Field Marshal uh, Harold Alexander, uh, that was the, who was the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Italy, awarded him uh, a Certificate of Gratitude uh, for his contribution to, uh, to the cause of freedom. 
here, uh, here we, uh, we move to another chapter, uh, probably the most fascinating one, uh, the work at the cultural division of the Italian embassy and uh, the, uh, the Italian scene. Uguccione settles down in New York at the beginning of 1953, and he uh, had the task of managing the cultural office at the Consulate General. So this was an important beginning. It was the first step of a long story, as has been already said. For the next five years, uh, his office at 690 Park Avenue became a hotbed of projects and ideas. Uh, he provided information on Italy. He promoted relations and contacts between the United States and the newly born Italian Republic. And his main um, mission was presenting Italy uh, as a new modern democratic country. Uh, it is within this context that the groundbreaking project of the Italian scene uh, was conceived. The Italian scene, and we see here on the slide the, uh, the first uh, issue of April um, 1953, was an English language bulletin designed to promote and disseminate Italian culture in the Anglophone world. Uh, it had an average circulation of 10,000 copies per issue. And uh, still today, there's a lot, really, it's like a, a, an incredible source of information about uh, the 1950s and the 1960s and US Italy relations. Uh, another interesting example of the materials produced by, uh, by Uguccione is this primer on Italy. Uh, and talking about the fact that he did not like to too much to advertise his own uh, work. Uh, if you look uh, closely, you see that uh, the, the name of the author here on the cover is Hugo Olebros. So he's hiding uh, his name uh, um, behind the pseudonym. Olebros is Sorbello uh, written on uh, reverse, but this gives an idea of, I, I think these little details give an idea of uh, is uh, personality. Other interesting examples of the materials produced by Uguccione during the, the 50s, and here we see him in the only picture that we have of him in his office in uh, New York. Uh, it, it says a lot, however, because there's a table full of papers, there are two phones, and in, in the letters that he wrote, uh, almost every day to his wife in Perugia, he kept saying and repeating that those uh, phones never stopped, uh, never stopped ringing. Uh, to the left, uh, we see an example of uh, Oguccione's creativity. Uh, and again, today, some things might be taken for granted, but uh, we're talking of the uh, 1954 and the idea of creating a big poster uh, with uh, uh, to celebrate past and present great Italians uh, and great Italians in a broad sense of the world, because here on the three of Italy, there are tons of leaves, uh, Ubuccione says, and he goes from Julius Caesar to Enrico Fermi. So there's this idea of Italian culture as something big than the story of Italy itself as a, as a nation. Uh, of course, and an idea that was shared by, uh, by many intellectuals. He also produced other materials and, and other posters, but this one in particular uh, says a lot about his creativity, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Ugocione was active in the promotion of Italian cultural uh, heritage in many different ways. Starting from 1954, he took care of the restoration of the Garibaldi Meucci house in Staten Island. And he also helped in collecting, uh, helped to collect memorabilia to be showcased in the future Garibaldi Meucci Museum, which finally opened to the public in uh, 1956. Here uh, in these slides, we see him proudly showing a red shirt, an original red shirt uh, to the consul uh, Carlo de Ferraris, uh, who was consul general uh, in New York at the time. 
Another, um, and to the right, we see a, a, a ceremony of flag raising in front of the Garibaldi Meucci, uh, Meucci Museum. Another very innovative uh, project he, uh, he worked on uh, and he promoted in uh, 1956 to, uh, to disseminate the knowledge of classical and modern Italian literature in the States was the creation of an audio anthology entitled Voci dalla Terra del Si, a violent record presenting prose and poetry recordings ranging from Dante and Boccaccio to Pirandello and Saba. Today, we would call it uh, an audio book, uh, but at the time, this was really a revolutionary idea to bring the voice of Italy. So Italian speakers uh, with excellent, uh, mm, uh, with excellent, knowledge of how to use the voice, such as Riccardo Paladini, which is one of the uh, persons that were involved in the project, who was the official voice of uh, the Italian uh, radio and television. They were invited to record excerpts uh, from uh, the classics and uh, modern literature, modern Italian literature, so that this could be uh, copies, these copies could be distributed throughout uh, the United States. Some of them, uh, as we can with a little uh, uh, imagination, uh, see on this picture, there is a, uh, a faded red stamp that says that uh, this copy is given as a gift to the members of the American Association of Teachers of Italian. Uh, it is interesting also to notice that each record uh, each vinyl was accompanied by multiple copies of the texts so that uh, listeners, uh, once the, the vinyl was playing, could follow the recording more easily. So uh, he had a thousand, a thousand initiatives and incredible ideas. Uh, he was also speaking again of the promotion of Italian cultural uh, heritage. In the 50s and 60s, Uguccione was very active and he campaigned on the press both in Italy and in the United States so that the new bridge connecting Staten Island and Brooklyn might be named after the Tuscan explorer who in, 19, in 1524 had been the first European to sail into New York Harbor. He was a leading member, uh, Guccione was a leading member of the Comitato Nazionale per le Onoranze a Giovanni uh, da Verrazzano. And uh, we see a picture of the Italian side of the uh, committee. Uh, and this group included, among others, Carlo De Ferraris, the Italian Consul General at the time in New York, Lino Lipischi, their love, who was the curator of, uh, at the Museum of the City of New York, John Lacorte, who was president of the Italian Historical Society of America, and Fortune Pope, uh, director of the newspaper Il Progresso uh, Italo Americano. When in 1964 the bridge was uh, finally opened, Ugoccione uh, enthusiastically gave the news on the pages of Il Corriere della Sera, where the dedication to Verrazzano was announced as. Uh, I quote this from his words, una vittoria della diplomazia, a victory of, uh, of diplomacy. The, uh, again, another way for, uh, in which Uguccione was active uh, in the promotion of Italian, uh, Italian language and culture were a, a series of cultural tours. In particular, uh, he, uh, we know that in 1957, Uguccione moved back uh, to Italy, but then his missions to the United States did not stop. In 1961, he went back and he was engaged in two cycles of conferences on the Risorgimento and on the development of Italy in the first 100 years of his uh, unitary history. Uh, during these two uh, cycles of conferences, he spoke about 40 times, lecturing in front of a variety of audiences at different venues, in street gatherings, at the end of banquets, in universities, at foreign relations associations, not to mention his numerous interviews on radio and television. 
On these slides, uh, we see this slide here, we see him in Philadelphia with Council General Ed Di Sogno. And to the right, we can see the reproduction of one of the many letters of appreciations that he received from the universities where, or from the venues where he had a chance to speak. In this case, uh, it was Stanford University uh, writing. Another important uh, cultural tour uh, was the one for the Dante celebrations of 1965, which were the first truly global celebrations dedicated to the father of the uh, Italian language. Uh, Ugoccioni was particularly active uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, but not only there. And in fall uh, 1965, he uh, held conferences at uh, several colleges, St. Mary College, Mills College, Holy Names College, Stanford University again, San Jose State College and University of California in San Francisco. But oftentimes he also spoke in non-academic contexts. Uh, on September 29, he even gave an address and uh, he told a joke during the ceremony organized to celebrate uh, the donation of a bronze bust of Dante to the city of San Francisco by the Società Dante Alighieri of Rome. And on October 21st, he spoke at the San Francisco uh, Public Library and nine uh, days later at the Sheridan Palace, as we can see uh, in these pictures here on the slide, he was awarded the key to the city of San Francisco uh, by John Francis uh, Shelley. And the key now is in the House Museum of Perugia at uh, Palazzo Sorbello. And we see a reproduction, of course, in the uh, exhibition panels. Uh, I'm moving to, toward the end of my presentation uh, with the last international mission of Ugucione in 1968. Uh, and that is linked to the Hemisphere Universal Exhibition at San Antonio, Texas. Uh, that was the first official World Fair held in Southwestern United States. And its theme was particularly intriguing for uh, Ugucione because it was the confluence of civilizations in the Americans. More than 40 countries and corporations were present and Italy produced a, a pavilion honoring Italian participation in the discovery and in the development of the new world. Here on, on this slide, we see a picture of the entrance to the, uh, to the Italian pavilion. Uh, the pavilion was divided into three main areas, Italian navigators, history of Italians uh, in the new world. Uh, so this is of particular interest probably uh, for Professor Tamburi and uh, the Calandre Institute and Italian art. Uh, Ugoccione gave his contribution, helping with the organization of the pavilion, writing uh, and writing the presentation brochure uh, to the pavilion. A 20 pages booklet, a dance with uh, information filled with information and interesting remarks about what it meant uh, half a millennium, as we can see here in the uh, introductory page of Italian presence uh, in, the, uh, in, the American, in the Americas. Once again, uh, and this is really a beautiful document to read, uh, it's evident how uh, wide his knowledge was, uh, what a subtle sense of humor he possessed, and uh, what, how, how a big pride and passion for Italian culture he had. And on top of that, he uh, underlined uh, very much the 68 were uh, difficult, crucial years uh, filled with uh, important international events, uh, he showed uh, on in more than one passage in the booklet, uh, faith in the power of uh, international cooperation, which was one of uh, you know, the strong ideas that he kept with himself for his entire life. I would like therefore to conclude my presentation uh, with a quote uh, the quoting a passage from the brochure, which sounds as significant today as it did um, in 1968. 
the story of the Italian presence in the, Americans, in the Americas began centuries ago. Distances having been canceled, and the proof is to now the fact that we are connected uh, through the, uh, the internet, distances having been canceled, today it is no longer a question of presence in this continent or that, but rather of cooperation uh, everywhere. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Antonella. Um, a, a, you, you know, I, I have to say, when I saw the, re the recordings of literature, it, it brought me back to a moment during my undergraduate days when actually one of my professors brought that into class and we listened <laughs> and we listened actually to recordings of uh, some of the poetry. I, I, it's just uncanny to, to sit here and be brought back. Um, but I wanted to um, also say that I think it's, I think it's, I think it's good that we are um, celebrating Uguccione uh, di Sorbello uh, during this year of 2021, in which we're commemorating Dante's death when 56 years ago, he was involved in the commemoration or actually the sort of anniversary and, and, and more positive commemoration of, of Dante's birth. So. Uh, that right there, it, it just seems uncanny. But I do want to say that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and we should let people know that the Italian scene is available. Um, it is available on JSTOR, if I'm not mistaken, you've made it available uh, on JSTOR. And so people can actually begin uh, going uh, to, getting online and going to JSTOR and, and actually seeing what it's all about. My hope, of course, is that um, we can create a more structured uh, pr uh, process of, uh, let's say, intellectual investigation, because it's uh, the, the American scene, the Italian scene, along with one or two other of these uh, extended publications, really is going to help us understand better the relationship back then, but also where it is today. And I think that's really important. I don't know if anyone else had any comments to make before um, we see there. I think there may be one or two questions from, uh, from our attendees, but any of the panelists? Roberto, did you wanna? Well, nothing more than what I said before. We have to go on with the research, thanks to Antonella Rongero, because it was a great uh, discovery for me, for us, Uguccione. And I came through him from studying in Prezzolini, but now it's really interesting to, to think about what these figures represented for, for the cultural diplomacy here, here in the United States, because they actually, are in really, they have done a really great job in what we now we call soft power and cultural diplomacy. They have been the pioneer in this sense. And also in the idea not just to connect Italy and the USA, but also to connect uh, Italian, Italian-Americans, Americans, Americans uh, all the people that are uh, read and uh, they want to know about the, the exactly, and studying um, studying now the work of Uguccione Sorbello, what we what we also do is we 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 get another insight onto some other individuals. Roberto uh, mentioned uh, Patri Covello, but we also we saw, for example, in one of the pictures, we saw Michele Cantarella. Right. For those of you who don't know, Michele Cantarella was a professor of Italian at Smith College for many right. years. Actually, for those of us who studied Italian in college, uh, you may remember a book of his that was very popular in the 60s and 70s called Prosettori del Novecento, right. in which he had brought, at that point, contemporary literature to the advanced uh, language study in, um, in, in the United States. It was a very popular book that was used. But Michele Cantarella was also in the 30s, a sort of gateway for a number of the intellectual exiles from Italy. 
and they sort of came into Northampton, which is where Smith College is located. And, um, and then they went to their various ways, who went to Harvard, such as Selvemini, who went to Chicago, such as Borghese. So this is very important. The other thing is for those of us who are in New York City, in one of the pictures, there was also John Lacorte, John Lacorte, who was also a major figure here in the 50s and 40s, 50s and 60s um, with regard to uh, Italian uh, and Italian American culture. I, I should say that we had the fourth, the third rebirth, the fourth edition series of our Italian American Review, which is a now a, a full fledged academic journal, began as a newsletter of sorts by, founded by John Lacorte, um, and it was passed on to Mercy College. It became now more of a journal. And then it came to the Calandra Institute for about a decade or so, and then sort of died down. And then it was revived again um, after I got here through the work of Joseph Shore and other staff members. So it, it, it's just, it, it underscores all of what I'm saying is all related to Ugo Cerni Sorbello. It's all related to his work. So all the more reason for us to go back and engage in this type of intellectual mining of, of sorts. Um, so I wanted to really underscore the, the tentacles, you know, the, the network that, that is there that we can retrace, I think, easier than what it might seem. You know, it even goes back into education because when I first came to Stony Brook University, to develop the Italian American Studies program, they had two or three courses. One of the courses was called the Italian American Scene. And I thought that was a really strange <laughs> name. I didn't know where these Italian professors got this name for this course. I'm starting to think now it came from some connection they may have had to uh, Gugione's work. And uh, I, I used to make fun of it. I said, there's gotta be a better title, but I kept it for some reason. And it still is there today. And now I understand why I kept it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and as, as you were talking, I was thinking about others as others as well, such as, you know, what was Ugucione's relationship to, for example, um, um, Ragusa, who was the owner of Esebani, which was both a publisher and a, and a, a bookstore, especially vibrant in the early part of the 20th century, right? So there are connections that I think yeah. uh, we, we're, we're going to find as, as we now you know, engage in this intellectual mining. I think there are connections we're going to find that are going to be extremely interested and extremely important to understand a presence of Italy in the first half of the 20th century that we didn't necessarily understand. And, and you know, again, uh, I, I think of what's the relationship between the work of Uguccione di Sorbello and, for example, the popularity of, of Italian writers such as Alberto Moravia, um, uh, uh, Carlo Levi, uh, a, a writer whom I've studied and is not a popular name necessarily among the sort of the, the world of um, uh, non specialists in Italian literature, Aldo Palazzeschi. These are writers who would publish their novels, their work in Italy, and within a year or two, would be translated and published in the United States. So all of this just gives us greater insight into why some of these things took place. He also gives us a missing link, I think, to the beginning of Italian American intellectualism. Um, and it would be interesting to study what his connections was, were to the community uh, and, and you know, by, by seeing what other people have said, had said about him. Because we know what other people say about us intellectuals sometimes, you know, you guys are an ivory tower and so on. And I say, no, no, no. I said, I, uh, I entered the, my first uh, ivory tower through the streets and I went back out into the streets. You know, I, it's, uh, you, you need to connect with the people and you need to be able to speak in many different registers. And that's what I found in his writings is that he can speak in all those different registers, not just speak English. One of the things was, they always thought that he was English because he had an English accent when he spoke um, English, um, because that's what his mother and his grandmother had, had, had passed on to him. 
Uh, but when he went at, for his first job, which only lasted a little while, uh, as an elevator boy, uh, as soon he he wanted to quit because his family wanted to go somewhere and take him. And he uh, he he told them uh, when they found out he spoke all these different languages, they began to see him as a potential diplomat for their hotel business. Uh, he eventually he didn't stay there and gone, but he he realized at that point. Uh, that he would be taken seriously as a man and that he had value other than being the son or the grandson of somebody. And I think that that's another extremely important. So what he's done in that little bit that I've seen um, is, is he's really laid a foundation for us to begin to understand how do you go from inside your family onto the streets, into the academy, into all these different levels of society and come back to the streets? Because that's what he was doing. When he was when he was writing, uh, you know, who knows why he didn't continue writing it. Um, he was coming back to it, and uh, those are the stories that we need. So I look forward to whatever we can do with this. Ruggiero, did you want to say something? You looked like you were ready to. Well, you know, I I could say so much, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I thought, I thought uh, a couple of things. First of all, might I underscore the fact that Antonella has been able to unearth a lot of these documents and links by, by, by pure research effort on the web, mostly on the web, because we don't have that much material. We have, a, uh, we have some material, but a lot of links are missing. And Antonella has began, began to fill some of these links with her research. So I really commend her research on, for example, all these tours that he, he did traveling in the United States, all these lectures. The other thing that struck me as particularly interesting uh, is what uh, Fred said about the synthetizer. Uchune actually was a great synthetizer. Um, an enormous amount of knowledge and a great ability to condense this knowledge in clear, um, intelligent uh, writing. And that's what the Italian scene is all about. Uh, hundreds of pieces on the most diverse uh, subjects. Yesterday, I was reading something on the Etruscans. Uh, something had been unearthed in the, in the 1950s. And he writes about it. And he, he makes some comments on Etruscan culture which struck me as particularly enlightening. So he had the capacity to, to, to move from theater to science to Etruscans, which is really, which I think nobody, I think, uh, uh, I don't think there are many individuals who can do that. Certainly I can't, but even try to think in that way. So, but I remember you know, his, his immense knowledge of everything. Um, so, so that's true what uh, Fred was saying. And it's also true that people like him get sidelined because who's going to read 50 pieces on 50 different things, theater, science? Uh, only a few people will read them because they're really interested in finding something out. But as a piece of, 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 of literature that's or, 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 or of scholarship, let's call it scholarship in a way, it is scholarship, journalism, a piece of, of good journalism, um, now, nobody will go through that. I mean, very few people will. And so that, that, that's why I think it's an important thing that we bring this back into JSTOR and make it available, because I'm sure it has a life of its own. People will go and look at these things and find things which are very difficult to, to find now. And so, so these are two things that struck me in these uh, interesting presentations that you made. Well, you know, like I said, um, we're, we're, we're inaugurating a whole new field of study on the, the local level, Ugucioni Sorbello, on a more broad level, the sort of, you know, we don't have a term, I mean, in, a, in Italian, we might say the uh, operatore, uh, culturale in English, we might say the cultural broker. I mean, there are a number of labels we can give to it, but but these are the people who um, 
who, who, whether it's synthesizing and then disseminating information uh, that then proves to be really fruitful to those, of course, who accept it to the sort of, re, to the addressees, as we would say, right, of, uh, of the information. So uh, I'm just delighted that, um, you know, we, we can be in the forefront of this. I mean, we're on the ground floor. Uh, not no pun intended with regard to Fred's reference <laughs> to the young <laughs> who is the elevator operator. But you know we're on the ground floor, and that's really wonderful. And 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 we're going to also, I think, as we move forward, and as perhaps we engage some younger scholars to look at this, that we're going to see how the whole cultural landscape, uh, the Italian cultural landscape in the United States, uh, in the first half if not the first 60 years of the 20th century is more vast and more profound than we really think. And I'm sure there was Italic of the American Association of Teachers of Italian. We heard tonight that he had a relationship with the AATI. Um, there was Middlebury College and founded in 1932, who journeys there only three years later in 1935, uh, teaching there and already connecting making that connection to Italy and the whole idea of immersion, things of that sort. So it, My and, and I'm a graduate of Middlebury College. And I have to tell you, I've never heard the name of Muccioni that's sort of Bello mentioned at, at, um, at Middlebury College. So, so these are all the connections that, you know, we're going to discover that were there that we didn't know about. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll, you know, and, and to get, get, get everything started. Well, for example, Giuseppe Pressolini used to name himself Imprenditore di Cultura. And right, the, right, and, the uh, entrepreneur. And for, the for entrepreneur, example, cultural uh, entrepreneur. Right. Exactly. And uh, Ugucione had, uh, had a long uh, exchange with, uh, yeah. with, uh, with Giuseppe. And maybe I, I would I like to add uh, one, one, one further element. Perhaps it would be important to um, open a dialogue with the um, Italian uh, institutions in New York. Uh, after all, my father was working for the Italian government when he did all these things. So it, it would be nice if uh, we could... Um, it was difficult to bring them in uh, at an early stage because of all the difficulties we had in preparing the exhibition, the, the pandemic. But now perhaps it would be uh, if the John Calandra Institute can help us with this, Bring them in uh, as partners of of, of this of this uh, perhaps of, of the symposium, uh, because after all, that's where he belongs. He belongs to the official Italian um, institutions. Um, as we said, he wasn't uh, at the Italian Cultural Institute because that didn't exist. But he, he, he was the precursor. He, he was, was the precursor. precursor. He was a precursor, so it would be interesting for 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 the Italian culture. We would we I mean our foundation would be delighted if they could join if they could uh, sure. be part of this of uh, this um, of this endeavor this uh, this uh, venture. By all means, in fact, you know, as as we spoke earlier off camera, um, we had we we had hoped, and as I mentioned briefly in my introductions, we had hoped that this would be a much more broad symposium because we thought about it a while ago. We thought COVID was going to be behind us and so on and so forth. And of course, that wasn't the case. And as we waited, we realized it wasn't going to happen. There are travel issues and things of that sort. So, but we've been in touch already with uh, both the director of the Italian Cultural Institute and also the Consul General. And we've mentioned that sometime later in the year, hopefully, you know, it'll be before 2022. So, and as I mentioned, beginning late November, early December, I mean, as soon as we know when you can get over, we will get put the, put the works into action and then um, have the symposium that we had hoped we would have, as we say in Italian, come di comanda. So, <laughs> so we're already thinking about that. Ruggiero, we've got that. We, we, it's already it's already in our minds. Yeah. I have a question. I've been working with you, Ruggiero, now for a, a, at least a year on this subject. It's the first time I heard you refer to him as your father. Is he your father? 
Yes, definitely. Uh, I, <laughs> if he knows to me, I, I, I just, you know, it's news to me. I thought you were a relative. <laughs> who, got, who got stuck holding his papers and said, we got to do something with this. Wow. I think, I think uh, he has uh, had a great influence in all my life, if you, if you ask me. <laughs> now, it, now it makes sense, the passion. I mean, I, I knew you were passionate about this, but now, and so he's writing his autobiography to you. Maybe he, he is, right. Oh, no, he is. He says he I, is. Yes, he is. And, and, but it, it has taken me 50 or 60 years of my life to begin to fully understand what he was up to. You know? well, uh, yeah. I guess I'm not doing so bad. It took me a year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so on, that, on that note, so we should, you know, our views, see, we have two books in front of us, right? And one is um, the sort of catalog slash almost mini biography, biography of Buguccione that is um, that's curated, edited, written, co-written by both Ruggiero and Antonella. And that's the maroon strike book with the picture on the cover. And then the other book is a about an inch and a half thick volume of various excerpt writings of his uh, in both English and Italian. So right now those two are available. And I think we're going to have to maybe try to make that other one available in English. We'll talk about that. Um, that could be a project as well. So, but um, but yeah, no, Fred, it's it's. Um, <laughs> I've just been working it's, so it's hard. Be part of, never it's part of the that. Italian diaspora, right? right. It's, it's it's part of that greater thing we call the Italian diaspora. Yeah. And it's the return, the return and the and the re-return. It's, 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 it's a, a coming point. and a going, right? It's a coming yeah. to the United States. It's working here, whatever. And it it's stop. a return of sorts. Right. Sure. It's a community. It's a community. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it is important, you know, as, as, Ruggiero, as you said, he worked in New York for, for, for what, five or six years. He was here on a daily basis. I mean, he is the precursor to what then becomes his work is what then becomes the work of the Ita of the of the Italian cultural institutes, right? Um, and as I said, the first one, I I I am not, I don't have as you know my fingertips the exact chronology of them all, but the first, of course, is in New York in 1961. A few years later, a few years, 15, 16 years later, San Francisco, but then we even later in Chicago. And so there are these half dozen cultural institutes now that exist that are doing the work that one man was basically doing in the 50s. So yeah, exactly. that in itself is also exactly. a study. Good. Um, do we have any, are there any comments, Carmine, or questions in, in the chat? No, okay, all right. Um, well, we, we, we've done, um, I think we, we've done a great deal as I, I was referring to this off camera as a spuntino, as sort of a pity fivo to the, to the full-fledged symposium that we're planning for, for when COVID allows. Um, but this is going to be recorded so others will also have available, um, have, have this, have access to it. So before we leave, of course, I need to thank first and foremost, Roberto Dolci who brought uh, the whole life and um, and 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 relatives of Ubuchone to our attention and Antonella as well, and we're delighted to have to have created this network with you guys, with Ruggiero, with you and the foundation, Antonella, with you and all the work you've done. Um, it, it's it's really one of those bridges. I'm delighted that we're making, we're constructing. I said to today, we had a visitor here from Ryan. I said that. Ubuchone, Ubuchone represents that sort of a narrow bridge that he alone had created. Now we're, we're widening that bridge and I'm delighted that we can do that off of his work. I need to thank a few people at the Calandria Institute, the staff here, first and foremost, Carmine Pizziruso, whom you can't see, but who is working behind the scenes here and who has set this whole thing up for us so we can speak to, to all of you tonight. So um, I want to give the last word to you, uh, Ruggiero, uh, before we cut off. 
Yes, uh, I think I think perhaps the la uh, the last word is uh, there's an, an interesting an interesting field of study here, um, research to be done, archives to be to be looked at, and uh, and so we hope that this uh, partnership, which also uh, I, 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 I I stress has in in the next few weeks the fellowship grant that we are launching together right. um, as part of this uh, this path uh, in our collaboration. I also want to thank the Università Pestranieri because uh, generously they have supported this idea and I hope they will support it further. And uh, so thanks to Roberto and um, Valerio de Cesaris uh, who, who took the time to 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 make that interesting little speech. So uh, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, I'm delighted we have brought uh, Ubuchone back to New York, although in circumstances which are a bit, you know, not perhaps what we what we might have imagined a couple of years ago. But still, he's here. He's behind you, and and hopefully people will enjoy reading about his story. And as we say, to be continued, dot, dot, dot. Nice. So with that, I want to wish everyone a buon proseguimento, as we say in Italian, and arrivederci a presto. Ciao a tutti. Thank you all. Bye. Arrivederci. Buona Thank notte. you. Buona notte.